So, hell of an E3, huh? Every year it's like a gamer's vacation, kicking back and seeing what new games and hardware all the big developers have lined up for the future. I'm not going to go into grades or who quote quote won, but Nintendo did pretty damn well for themselves. We've learned of a lot of games set for later this year and into the next, and the Switch's early library is looking to be way bigger than those of Nintendo's previous systems. And seeing how there's talk of a new Super Smash Bros. game of some kind being on the horizon, well, the discussion's inevitable. With new faces and new entries in storied franchises, every new batch of Nintendo information sets off speculation for how it could affect the Smash chances of the characters included in it. Fair warning, this is all just conjecture and it's mostly for fun. I like to think I have an ear to the ground with this kind of thing, but I know full well how hard this kind of stuff is to predict. So let's take a look under the surface, shall we? Look at this year's big reveals tell us about the next entry of Smash and who could join the fight. First off, the uh, elephant in the room. We've been hearing rumblings of a Switch version of Smash 4 for months now, so uh, where is it? The complete lack of any news regarding Smash caught a lot of people off guard, myself included. It seemed like the perfect time to unveil this Smash 4 Deluxe or whatever they're up to, and yet, nothing. I've seen a lot of people jump to conclusions about all this, assuming all the rumors we've heard must all be false, that this must mean they're actually building a brand new game from the ground up instead. I want to say... careful. Just because something unexpected happened doesn't mean everything we know is a lie. There are several possible reasons why we didn't get a Smash announcement at E3. It doesn't automatically mean we'll be stuck waiting another two or three years or more. I've seen the idea floating around that maybe they're waiting because they didn't want Smash to steal the thunder of ARMS or Splatoon 2, since one is already out and the other is less than a month away. I didn't agree with the notion when it was brought up before E3, but maybe that really is what happened. Whatever the reason, there are a couple things we can take from this. For one, even if it's an enhanced port, we're probably looking at a later release date than many of us initially expected. The Switch's library is loaded with big releases nearly every month for the rest of the year, and if they're comfortable releasing a different fighting game in late September, I think now we're probably talking next March or maybe even the spring for this Smash 4 Deluxe. Although there's another possible scenario. I've seen some interesting arguments that we might be looking at a Splatoon 2 kind of deal, with a Smash game that reuses the assets of its predecessor to build off it and create something more than just a port. I don't know how likely it is, but we are treading uncharted waters here, so to speak. Who knows, maybe we could even end up seeing more DLC or even Splatoon style rolling updates. I will say this though. I still don't see a 100% brand new Smash 5 happening yet. This isn't the right situation for it. Smash 4 DLC only got done a year and a few months ago, and the game is still going strong despite the Wii U's small install base. Throwing all that out and putting the dev team through the full grinder all over again just for the sake of waving a new game flag just isn't worth it. And if you remember, Smash 4's Wii U version wasn't able to salvage the system because it released too late in its life cycle. Starting over now would do the same thing to the Switch, and since they'd have had to make that call before the Switch was even unveiled and we'd learn how well it would sell, it felt like a huge risk. More than anything, the fans just want more content, and that can be done with a port or a full expansion to Smash 4 for the Switch while getting Smash on the new system quickly and keeping the workload and stress levels of the developers at a manageable level. It's a situation where everyone wins, so hopefully that's what's going on. With that out of the way, it's on to the games themselves. And where better to start than Nintendo's newest IP? And I mean literally, dropping the day after E3 ended. ARMS has done fairly well for itself in its first couple of weeks, with decent sales and a pretty good reception overall. While the game's content is a little thin at the moment, Nintendo has promised rolling updates just like Splatoon that'll keep adding to it over time and keep people playing. The birth of a successful new franchise, with Smash Talk going on, has well, you know where this is going. Just like the Inklings before him, Springman has seen a lot of people talking about him as a potential newcomer. He's got some tools here as a possible brawler with long range but high commitment disjointed punches. And of course they'd want to stick him in and promote the new franchise, right? Uh, right? Well, here's the thing. While we don't know 100% what the dev team's exact mindset is, we can at least make educated guesses based on what they've said and done before and there is a history of Sakurai and his crew waiting on characters from brand new IPs. It happened with the Inklings during DLC talk, 
Happened with Olimar when Melee and the first Pikmin game and Wii's close to each other. And may have also happened with the Wii Fit Trainer getting passed on for Brawl. It seems they'd rather wait and see how the new rooks pan out before they make a snap judgment on them, more or less. Note that this only seemed to apply to characters. Could we see some arms trophies like the Inkling one we got? Sure. Spring Stadium as a stage? Maybe. But Spring Man himself is probably going to be waiting until Smash 5 unless this rumored Smash game ends up releasing later, much later, than we initially expected. But ARMS wasn't the only fighting game to get a spotlight during E3. A few days prior, a special presentation gave us a double team of Pokemon reveals, a Switch version of Pokemon Tournament, and new main games in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. And much like the move double team, it was pretty controversial and a handful of people didn't like how it was implemented. Mostly because a lot of us were expecting something a little different. And you know how the internet gets when stuff defies their expectations. Nonetheless, I still think there's reason to be optimistic. Pokémon DX's easy multiplayer and migration from a dying system to a fast rising one is exactly what it needed and what its fans were hoping for. And Ultra Sun and Moon are being set up to be something different from what we've seen before. Not quite a third version or sequel games. More than anything though, these reveals are further proof that Pokémon is as strong as it's ever been. And that means there's a very, very good chance it'll get quite a bit of new content in this upcoming Smash game. I said before that Generation 7 is even more standout mons than usual, and I think it's absolutely possible that we could see not just one, but two of them get in depending on how much new content there is. Far as the likely choices go, Decidueye is the biggest standout right now, with prominence and a unique mix of plant-based powers and archery. Being Pokémon's newest fighter just hammers that prominence in more. And with Ultra Sun and Moon apparently having new mons or forms, it's got me wondering just who could be getting an even bigger shot on the arm from there. Just saying, there have been placeholders for more Lycanroc forms in the Global Link for months now. But with how big a deal they're making out of Pokémon DX, can we see some content from their sneak into Smash? After all, Bandai Namco is developing the former and lent a hand with the latter. Can we see some trophies or music sneak in? Or something more? How about Ferrum Stadium as a Pokémon Stadium style stage that doesn't transform, keeping its balanced layout at all times? But wait a minute, we need to talk about the game that opened up the Nintendo Spotlight to begin with. Isn't it amazing how far the series has come? It took a fan movement just to get the first Xenoblade game out of Japan. Now the third one was just an E3 headliner. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is shaping up to have all the elements that made its predecessor so highly regarded. And we all can't wait until, hopefully, the holidays to play it ourselves. The upcoming release, and the situation it's happening in, bodes really well for our new protagonists, Rex and Pyra. The team of Blade and Driver rely on working together in combat, with Pyra empowering Rex's weapon and abilities to fight to his fullest potential. They're in the making of an interesting moveset in there so far, though we do need to know more to truly have a feel for how they'd fight. Xenoblade's in a very interesting position as a series right now. It's one of a few with a rotating cast. Each new entry features a new setting and new set of main characters. Since relevance is such a big deal for most first-party newcomers, exactly who gets in may depend on when the newcomers were chosen and what the initial planned release window for the game was. Half a year ago, Elma of Xenoblade Chronicles X was in a good position for our rumored Smash game. But the longer we wait, the worse her chances, and the greater those of Rex and Pyra. We saw a handful of new games and new trailers, but one particular one saw the reveal of new content. E3 gave us an extensive look at Breath of the Wild's upcoming DLC, showing off the first pack in its new trials, new equipment, and even a new difficulty mode. But what has me more interested is what they teased alongside it, the Champion's Ballad, a second part set for later this year. The pack promises a new original story, a new dungeon to test your skills, and other unknown details. While they've been beating around the bush on whether we'd be able to play as anyone new, if any characters do get a special focus in this new side story, they may well be potential Smash candidates. But who would get the focus, based on what we know? One of the fallen champions, seeing how the thing is named after them? This incarnation of Zelda, who features prominently in its promotional art? Or maybe someone else we haven't had reason to consider yet will spring to the forefront once we learn more. I don't know enough yet to make that call, but it's worth keeping a close eye on. Especially with how many fans have been clamoring for some kind of Zelda newcomer. 
we have one more series to cover, one that many fans were worried was dying or dead. But unknown to us, it was alive and well, waiting for its chance. And all it needed to shock the gaming world was a single image. Welcome back, Samus. The surprise reveal that Metroid Prime 4 is in development was a picture that launched a thousand reactions. And then a second Metroid title came out of nowhere and launched a thousand more. In just a few short months, the Hunter will be doing her thing once more. And sometime in the near future, she'll be making the switch to the Switch. With Metroid finally in the spotlight again, could this mean a newcomer for the rumored Smash game? Well, it depends, and on a lot of factors we don't yet know. Samus Returns may not even introduce anyone worth looking at, seeing how it's a remake of Metroid 2 and therefore a very isolated experience. There's also a certain giant space dragon, but again, we don't know what Ridley's involvement in the upcoming games could even be yet, if he's in them at all. Plus, we don't know what they're planning on doing with the Pyrosphere stage, or if Ridley would be written out of his role as Boss Hazard there. And there's also the whole thing about Sakurai worrying that a playable Ridley might not feel true to character. We don't know how easily he'd change his mind. Or who knows, maybe he already has. But despite the unanswered questions, there is someone worth keeping an eye on. The mysterious Silux is going to be involved some way in Metroid Prime 4 confirmed by developer interviews a while back after showing up in the Stinger of Prime 3, and then again in Federation Force. Thing is though, all we know about Silex is his grudge against the Galactic Federation and his signature abilities, the health siphoning shot coil and the morph ball like lockjaw form. What else does Silex have to build a moveset around? Will Metroid Prime 4 even release at the right time to make him relevant enough to be considered? It's just too early to say. Turns out even without an actual Smash announcement, there's a lot of stuff with Smash implications to talk about. From new IPs to enhanced ports to sequels, DLC, and surprises, many of Nintendo's newest games have characters, locales, and a lot else to offer. Whatever the future ends up holding for Smash Brothers on the Nintendo Switch, it's sure to be an interesting one. And hopefully, a future as bright as that of the Switch itself. If you're into more Smash talk and speculation, I recommend giving a look to my series Challenger Approaching. It's all about crafting character concepts for potential Smash newcomers, going into minute detail on how they'd fight in a way that feels true to their identity and authentic to Smash's style. And if you want to see more of these videos more often, please consider supporting me on Patreon. It'd give me greater means to overcome a lot of pain and other issues I've been dealing with for a long time now, while you get rewards for doing it. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. We'll be waiting with bated breath at least a while longer for official Smash news, but until then, Keep checking in here for more character concepts, more speculation, and who knows what else. See you then.